This evening's talk uh, is uh, how to uh, create your own zombie apocalypse uh, with punk scientist Frank Swain. Uh, and he'll be getting us. Uh, he has a book which is coming out not in time for Christmas um, called How to Make Your Own Zombie. Is that right? That is correct. I remembered it. Well done. God, things are improving. Um, I am now going to move out of your way so that you'll now get a gust of air from the fan. <laughs> uh, and I will now pass it over to the tender ministrations of Mr. Frank Swain. <laughs> Although I have confidence that my voice can reach uh, the back all sort of five rows of it, uh, I've been told to speak into the mic, so uh, forgive me for having this here the whole night. Uh, it's for recording purposes. So, hello Edinburgh! Hello! That was, that was pretty good. You're, you're more awake than the Secret Garden Party people. Uh, but first of all, can I get uh, your best blood curdlingest ever brains? Because we all know that's what zombies after, so please give me one big brains, please. Three, two, one. Brains! That was Good, especially you, sir. You get a gold star here. But one more time, as with all your passion and with all the horror of Barbara as she sees us on his stomach towards us the first time in Night Linda, give me your best brains. Three, two, one. Thank you very much. Yes, this is the 100% true science of uh, making your own zombie. So I, I'm sure you're all here with the best of intentions, and there is no scientific research that's ever been. So uh, let's press on to start. So where do we start? Uh, the zombie myth, most people pin coming down to the magical island of Hispaniola, where we find a nation of Haiti. And the first person to actually write about uh, the zombies, the walking dead, who were supposedly haunting the Isles, was a guy called Lafcadio Hearn, who uh, was a fantastic writer. He's best known for his uh, writings of Japan. He went to Japan, he was naturalized there, took on a wife. Um, and wrote about the folklore. But he wrote about folklore and things wherever he was. And so he spent 10 years in New Orleans and he wrote about all of the stories there. He even wrote a cookbook, funnily enough, uh, of all the recipes. And New Orleans food is great. Has anyone been to New Orleans? A couple of you. Uh, did you eat there? Yes. Was it good? Yes. Yes, exactly. I did all those three things and it was good. That's correct. We probably ate the same place. Uh, yeah, so uh, Lafcadio Hill was there. He was a travelling writer and so he decided to sort of uh, go around the, the Caribbean. He wrote about these things called uh, these zombies. And he was very intrigued by this because he thought there's nothing else that sounds quite like a zombie. And he put this question through to the people that he met. He was staying with this old, uh, old lady and he said, what's, what's this zombie now? And uh, she said, oh, it's, it's something that makes a disturbance at night. Oh, that's a bit of a strange thing to say. And he said, is it, is it not someone who's, who's brought back from the dead? And they said, no, 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 that's, that's a different kind of monster. The zombie, it's like a, a three-legged horse passing you in the road. <laughs> and he said, are you sure? Because he could kind of sense that his, right, you know, his editors back at Harper's Bazaar didn't really want to hear stories about lame horses. Uh, and uh, her daughter's like, well, it's like a great fire that you see while walking at night. And, and the more you walk towards this great fire, the further away it gets. Like, mm, wow, that wasn't particularly great. So he, he never actually managed to find the zombie. He was a bit disappointed in the search. And it took uh, another 40 years or so. In the 1930s, this guy called uh, William Seabrook heads out to Haiti. And William Seabrook was one crazy asshole. Uh, he had just finished a book on um, cannibalism and, 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 and African tribes. Back. So he went to stayed with the Gur tribe in West Africa. And he was uh, very irritated by the fact that this cheating that he was staying with couldn't accurately describe the taste of human flesh. Couldn't really put a put a pin down on it. And uh, he refused to publish his book. Seabrook refused to publish his book until he had that vital detail. And so when he went back to Paris, he bribed a mortuary assistant uh, to take some human flesh uh, off this sort of unwilling donor at a morgue and bring it over. And he took it around to his friend. And he said, uh, oh, it's, it's a kind of wild game that's very rare. Uh, would you mind cooking it up for dinner? And so they cooked it up and he said it tasted like veal. So there you go. Anyone wondering what human flesh tastes like? Apparently it's not like pork, it's like veal. Uh, so William Seabrook, he went to, uh, he met Alistair Crowley, the famous English occultist, and he started his lifelong fascination with the occult and witchcraft, and so he finds himself in Haiti, and he goes out to, uh, to track down a zombie, and his, his, his guy, Polynes, a man, wonderful name, Polynes, uh, he, he's, uh, he was a countryman, 
Uh, but he wasn't very superstitious. He sort of believed all these crazy stories you hear in Haiti. He said, ah, you build a story, a little bit of voodoo and all this kind of thing, you know, it's, it's just stories. And Seabrook mentions the zombies. He said, well, what about these zombies? Uh, you know, they're quite interesting. These people come back from the dead. And Seabrook's face got very dark. And he said, oh, you mustn't joke about these things. There are, there are more things here than you might could possibly imagine. These are, zombies are very, very real. He said, in fact, there are some zombies not far from me, just working the fields over there. And so he took Seabrook and he went over and, and he met this zombie and uh, they were working in this field. And uh, Seabrook said, my God, you know, he looked into his face and had this, he said his eyes seemed not just expressionless, but they were incapable of expression. I couldn't feel anything anymore. He said, my God, maybe this is really true. Maybe they really are raising people from the dead here in Haiti. Uh, and he shook his hand, he said, bonjour, compreur. The zombie just sort of stood there. Didn't make any reply, and this old lady who was like that gang master sort of shooed him away and said, It's a fair de negre, not just a fair de blanc. She was, you know, the affairs of blacks, not the affairs of whites. Uh, and sort of shooed him away. So Seabrook was the first man to actually actually meet a zombie, although he didn't actually dig down to the origins of it and how they managed to bring these people back from the dead. Uh, and so it took another guy called Wade Davis. Now, Wade Davis uh, appeared in the 19, goodness, 70s, he got there, 1980s. He went to Haiti, and it was because these rumours had come out. So zombies have been, you know, these rumours have been knocked around for a long time. But then a very special one happened. And this was a guy called Clavius Narcisse. And Clavius Narcisse had uh, the bad fortune to die. He'd gone into this uh, hospital in the chapel, uh, coughing up blood, feverish, very sick, uh, died soon afterwards, which is not uncommon in Haiti. But what wasn't common uh, was he did it in this American-run hospital. And the American-run hospital meant that he got a, a death certificate, and it was you know, a thumbprint was put on it by his sister. It's all certified. And 18 years later, his sister is out, you know, shopping, doing a, a general Saturday grocery run in uh, the marketplace, and she bumps into none other than Clavius Narcisse, the brother that she'd, uh, that she'd buried 18 years earlier. And so word of this got back to uh, got back to Harvard because the guy who ran the institution, a psychiatric institution, a guy called Doyon, uh, he said, "I've got this guy. He, you know, I've got 200 people who swear to God that uh, he is." Clavius Narcisse, he remembers things that only Clavius Narcisse could know, these childhood memories, um, and yet we've got his death certificate, so we think you should check it out, because maybe there is something to this, maybe there is some kind of toxin that can make someone appear dead, that can make them sick looking, that can put them into a death-like state, but they're really not dead. And that was the crux of this, this voodoo myth, that these, these guys called these bokos, these sorcerers, had some way of, of casting a spell on you. And the spell would make you go into a coma, you'd stop breathing, you know, from the outside you'd look completely dead, but you'd be completely conscious. That was a terrifying thing. So, Clarence Nuss, he's claimed that he could hear the people at his funeral, you know, crying and hammering the nails into his coffin and putting him into the tomb. Um, uh, and then he was sort of raised, you know, the, the bot came on a few days later and dug him out and beat the crap out of him and force fed him these, uh, these, you know, these drugs that would keep him in a, in a zombified state and he was forced to work on a plantation for, for you know, the next 18 years. And so Harvard said, well this sounds pretty good, you know, you can see the dollar signs lighting up in their eyes. So like if there is a, you know, some kind of drug that we don't know about that can put people into some kind of suspended animation, that's pretty cool. Rumor was it that uh, NASA was looking for something like this to send people to Mars because it's a long time, it's a lot of water, a lot of food that you have to give them. Wouldn't it be a lot better if you could put people into suspended animation? You know, so they dispatched Wade Davis, and uh, I like to, you know, this is, uh, oh, there's Harvard, good days. There's Wade Davis. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously, this isn't Wade Davis, uh, this is Indiana Jones, but I like to think this is what Wade Davis likes to see himself as. Because uh, has anyone read The Serpent and the Rainbow, the book that he wrote after us? So no, it's a it's a rip roaring book. To you know, a, is it a good book? It's a pretty good. It's a fun book. It's not scientific per se. Uh, he goes around. He uh, you know drinks crazy drug drinks with shamans and runs off their daughters and you know has lots of bar fights and things. It's a very dramatic sort of uh, you know book. So he goes there and he makes friends with these bokos and he says, yeah, you're going to show me how to make the zombie poison. And so he befriends this guy who agrees to do it. That's the, the shaman there. Obviously that's not actually the shaman, that's the bad guy from uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. But I like to think that this is how the shaman probably likes to see himself <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. So, uh, the way Davis, he succeeded, so he watched them make this. Uh, and and they, he, he came back with this zombie powder. So, we're going to make it tonight. I need a volunteer from the audience. Is anyone feeling 
up to the task of making a zombie cocktail with me. Me. Nominate Crozier. Oh, yeah. you are the fastest. <laughs> up like a rocket. That hand. Okay, come on to the front foot. Is it Claudia? Uh, Alex. 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 Alex, sorry. Alex, everyone give Alex a round of applause, please. Okay, so I need you to stand, well, more or less there ish. And uh, first of all, we need the, the, the sacred chalice. So, uh, there's your sacred chalice to put all of the uh, thing in. And now, Wade Davis had a few ideas for what was possibly in this thing. The first thing was uh, a uh, herb. Hang on, let me grab it. So, so this is a uh, Jimson weed, and Jimson weed. We'll put that in there. Jimson weed takes its name from Jamestown in uh, in the United States, uh, and it has a lot of other wonderful names like moonflower and thorn apple, and it's a uh, very hallucinogenic. It's a uh, it's, it's you know it's, it's bad news all around. So it's called Jamestown because. Uh, the British were sent there to, to sort of suppress a rebellion, and the soldiers who arrived were drugged. They put some, you know, the, the, people, the townspeople who were there who were upset, they drugged these soldiers with this, uh, this uh, weed, Statura species, which is related to the Solanaceae family, which of course has got potato, tomato, nicotine, you know, all that kind of tobacco, that kind of stuff in it. Similar plan. Uh, they gave it to these soldiers and they went, you know, fruit loopy for about 11 days. And they spent the whole time uh, laughing, giggling, chasing each other, blowing feathers, just you know, having a total trip. Uh, so they tripped balls for 11 days and then they woke up and they didn't remember anything. So uh, Wade Davis thought that was probably one of the things that was in there because this grows everywhere in Haiti. Uh, and some of them used it, but it wasn't in all of them, which was interesting. So the second track, there was a few ingredients that were in absolutely everything. So. Uh, what have we got here? What the cha cha? Let's put that in first. So there you go. You're going to have to put that in there if you've got two hands to. Uh, cha cha is another hallucinogenic drug. You have to push it. It's a safety cap. These are dangerous instruments, man. You know, I'm not going to carry these around where kids can get a hold of them. There we go. All right, put that one in there. There we go. So cha cha, what else do we have in here? Somewhere in my pocket. Oh, there it is. I hope you're not making. Don't get it on your skin, whatever you do. Okay, that's good. Is it all in there? Yeah. Oh, not all of it. Not all of it. Oh, no, serious business, man. This is, it was, oh, a dosage makes the poison. Absolutely, throw it all in there. Uh, now, I'll prepare our, our next ingredient. Hang on. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Hope I don't cut myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there we go. Okay. Next one that we... <laughs> <laughs> So this is our next ingredient, which is quite clearly a frog, uh, and this is the Bufo marinus, otherwise known as a cane toad. Again, very, very poisonous, so we'll squeeze in that. Hang on a second. <laughs> that goes in. I hope I don't get on the mic too much. And uh, the next one, the cha cha, this is the itching pea. And uh, you put this on, it's like a, it, it has utricating hairs on it, which means you put it on your skin, it gets very itchy, and you rub the poison into your skin. So we're going to use some of this as well. <laughs> There we go, in goes the cha cha, oh sorry, the itching pee, and finally, the, the, the one that Wade Davis was most impressed by pufferfish poison. Ooh, how many people know about the pufferfish? Have you heard of it? Yeah. yeah. You all know it's poisonous, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Do you know that the Japanese make a delicacy out of it because yeah. they're all batch and saying, let's face it? Uh, do you know what it's called? Like what it does to you? The toilet Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, fugu. It's called fugu. And uh, fugu is made from puffer fish. It's very specially prepared. And the idea is when you eat it, you get a kind of tingling on your lips. And you kind of feel euphoric, like headed, kind of happy but drunk. Uh, and that's if the chef gets it right. <laughs> if the chef gets it wrong, then uh, it puts you into a kind of paralytic state where all your all your muscles become paralysed, and you sort of first you sit, you slow your speech, and then you fall over, and you lie down on the ground, and you start. You know, you eventually, your your muscles in your chest paralyzed so you can't breathe anymore and you suffocate and all during all of this time nothing wrong with your brain so you can hear all of this going on around you uh you know and really ruining everyone else's dinner uh, <laughs> to be fair so we're gonna put some of this in as well in it goes Ooh, doo -doo 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 -doo. and now the very very sacred ceremony of preparing it <laughs> there we go. All right, give it a little shake, but not too much. Don't want the cha-cha to explode. Oh, that might be too much, whatever. All right, and finally into the ceremonial vessel. Pull it up. There we go. Pour it. Close enough. Yeah. I would say use a strainer, but to be fair, they, uh, it's been all right. The, 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 the weed stayed in there. All right, pack that back up. And there you go. There's some zombie poison for you. What you do, 
Well, who wants to drink some zombie poison then? <laughs> Got a few hands up. Uh, how's it taste? Lovely. Lovely. There we go. Oh, oh fantastic. Brilliant. Uh, everyone give us a round of applause. It's good. And so Wade Davis, he honestly thought that he cracked this because it's got tetrodotoxin, it's the poison of the proper fish, it kind of matches the symptoms, but it didn't really match what happened to Clavius Narcisse because although it can put someone into a comatose state, uh, it wouldn't keep them in necessarily the dissociated fugue that was necessary to, to keep him enslaved for, uh, you know, for the next uh, 18 years. And more to the point, when he sent these samples back to America, the first test showed that they did work, and they put monkeys into uh, and rats into this kind of hibernation state. They didn't work on everything, and so some people critiqued him. They said he didn't do it very properly, blah blah blah. And to be honest, it, it was never resolved. There was an argument for a bit, and uh, that was it. That was the end. Wade Davis didn't really pursue this very much. He wrote a book. It got turned into a very bad film, uh, and everyone kind of forgot about the zombies. Uh, in Solomon, I saw the Inquisition of One. And so this guy comes along. <laughs> yes. This is a man called Roland Littlewood, who is every bit as awesome. It's not fake, this is actually him. He is every bit as awesome as this picture suggests. <laughs> and uh, Roland Littlewood travelled to Haiti in 1998, I think, uh, with Channel 4 and National Geographic to track down these, these zombies. And so he did, for the first time, it's hard to believe, he did the first ever clinical examination of the zombies. So he met Claudius Narcisse, who was still living in an institution uh, with the Duyons, and he met two other zombies. And they did a clinical uh, and, uh, you know, inspection of these people, but they also did something very, very interesting. They took a DNA test. <laughs> and they tested the DNA of these purported zombies against the people who had uh, claimed that they were deceased family members. And so the second part of the puzzle is most interesting, because none of the DNA matched. Mm -hmm. So these people were not actually related to the families who had taken them in, which is interesting. The second part was that all of them showed some kind of developmental disability. So one person was diagnosed with uh, some kind of mild schizophrenia, another person had um, a fetal alcohol syndrome, another one was learning impaired probably through some kind of period of anoxia. Uh, and so the, the, the end result was that it was a strange cultural artifact in, in Hades where accusations of, uh, of zombie making, when someone says you turn my kid into a zombie, whatever happens like that, uh, it's, it's sort of like the community tensions playing themselves out, but not just that simply. Because if somebody slights you and someone sort of annoys you in a way, you take on a zombie. And you find this person who's mentally Ill, wandering around the street, you just grab them in and you say, this is my son and uh, you, you are responsible for doing the things that you did to them. And now you have to make amends to me. And it's a way of diffusing and uh, sort of uh, uh, playing out these tensions in real time. And so one of the girls was fantastic, they, they sort of took her back to where she last remembered being. Uh, with her new family who said she'd been zombified and when she got there everyone was like oh hey you're back you've been gone for nine months and then her family came out and so these two families started fighting <laughs> over whose daughter she really was and so it's very very interesting but um Ultimately, Littlewood had to say that you know, zombies were nothing more than, than slightly mentally ill people. It was just a strange artifact. So no one ever found a zombie poison. And it passed away. There's a picture of Clavius Narcisse kind of squinting for the camera. Um, and to my knowledge, he still lives in Haiti to this day, living his, uh, his uh, post-life existence. And so that's not really what you came here to see, is it? Because you wanted to hear about people actually being brought back from the dead. Ah, uh, Frank, I haven't got time to chase fairy tales. I want to bring someone back from the dead. And so I'm going to tell you how to do that. This is a man named Robert E. Cornish. Around the 1930s, uh, the same time as Seabrook was exploring uh, the islands uh, of the Caribbean, uh, Robert E. Cornish was engaged in trying to bring people back from the dead. And he was a child genius. He got his uh, PhD. He got his first degree by 18. Got his PhD by 22. Anyone here got a PhD? Couple of one, two. Anyone get it by the age 22? No, no. He really was a child genius. He was very, very good. And so he set his mind. He thought, well, why not try bringing people back from the dead? That seems like a you know, nice thing to challenge myself to. To have a free time. So he was at the University of Berkeley, Berkeley, sorry. And his first attempt was on a guy who'd thrown himself off the bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge, and had been dead for about four hours, uh, which is quite a heroic effort. 
on Robert Cornish's past. So we're going to try and reenact what he was doing to bring us back back there. So I'm going to need uh, another volunteer from the onset, preferably someone quite small. Roger. Yeah, go on then. Oh, cool. Got to go about the hand up. <laughs> Sorry, you were so good. Hang on, have you got a skirt on or a low cut top? No. No, no you're okay. So long as you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> Those, yeah, it's the only someone we're going to ask who's not in a skirt or low cut. So, right. Sorry, what's your name? Anna. Anna. Everyone give Anna a round of applause. <laughs> right. Now what I need is... Right, bear with me one second. <laughs> I'm also going to need two volunteers who are feeling quite strong. Ewan! Preferably big men with big Ewan. arms. Ewan! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ewan! Here! Here! No. Two. Here. Yes, you sir, you're looking like you fit the bill. Come on up. Alright. <laughs> right, hang on, let me put my uh, my outfit on. I don't know why you're laughing, this is serious science. I'm trying to bring someone back from the dead. All right, boom. <laughs> Give me my microphone back. Okay, there's our zombie elixir, put that away. And this is Robert Cordish. He had a very ingenious idea for bringing people back from the dead. And he thought, if you died, uh, you know, what does it mean when you're dead, anyone? You know, what's, what, what is a pretty good hallmark of, of deadness? Being dead. dead. I'd, I'd like to expand a little bit upon that. Rigor mortis is a good one. Anyone else? Heart stop. Heart stop. You've mm. got your heart stopped. Yes, yes. No organs working. Exactly. So your, your breathing stops, your heart stops, and you're feeling pretty cold. Those are all good answers. So he thought that maybe if you could just restart the circulation, then this person would perk up. So, is Anna, is it? Yes. Okay, Anna, I need you to sit on the chair. Looking over that way, you are about to get revived. So you are playing the role of WV, WG, a mechanic who uh, fell into San Francisco Bay, a very, very cold, cold place. He was pulled out of there for the f about four hours the firemen tried to revive him. When they gave up, Cornish stood in. So I need to leave a bit back. You, sir, I need you to stand right there, over there. And you need to stand about here. This microphone sounds going to be in the wrong place. Let's move that over there. And so here was a, a, his genius idea. So you lean back and just catch her so she doesn't fall on the ground. There we go. Back, 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 back. And you grab her feet. Yeah. And all he was going to do, he had a seesaw. He got it to the and he just tipped them backwards and forwards. There you go. Get, sit down and going. Right. And what's happening here? That's about it. This is good. You guys can work for St. John's Ambulance. It was great. And you can't see it, but Anna's internal organs are kind of like slopping backwards and forwards inside her. And they press down upon a diaphragm and then they fall back again. And that keeps going. And so that's, that's kind of swishing all of her. And all her blood sort of running down back, you know, running down to her feet, backwards and forwards. And all of that. Cornish hoped would be enough to restart the circulation. Restart. Okay, you can stop it now. She might vomit. Okay, okay. You can sit her up. Okay, you sit her up for a second. I'm, I'm, I'm not done with you yet. You have to stay a little. Oh my goodness. Cool. As you can see, medicine is hard. You're feeling okay. Okay, good. So. But it wasn't enough, so uh, this guy was very, very cold, and Cornish thought, well, maybe this person needs to be warmed up, you know, maybe this is the problem, because obviously when you're very cold, your veins and your muscles get stiff, you're, you know, you're not getting much circulation, so he had another trick up his sleeve, which, where have I put them? Oh, they're in here, and he decided to heat up the body, so what he needed was some kind of electrical heating apparatus, and we have our electrical heating apparatus here, hang on, I'm gonna, uh, Excellent, fantastic. All right. Grab another one there. Put one on your leg. There we go. Now, this is high science. I don't know why you're laughing. This is serious, actual research that was done in the 1930s. And put another one up on your arm there. Okay. So he put all this up and he put the warmers on and he thought, I'm going to warm up this time. This time it's definitely going to work. It was an electrician who'd been electrocuted. Uh, and he thought, this person's a bit fresher, so I've got a better chance of doing it. So on the teeter totter again. This time you're playing the electrician who's been electrocuted. And I need you to slide it back into it. Hang on, let's just put this chair back a little bit over here. There we go. I don't want you to fall off. All right, you ready? And away you go. So the heating is coming on. And it's warming them up, and although this person has been in an ice box, which is kind of standard practice, he's smushing them backwards and forwards. Can anyone guess what is going to happen with these heating pads? Why are you 
comfortable when you sit in the hot thing, but the stuff around you, you know, just in the car, you know, and like the objects, the seats are really, really hot, but you feel okay? Why is that? Anyone? It's because your blood circulates around, it carries that heat around your body, and so it's constantly cooling. But what happens is, you have an animal like circulation going on, so these heating pads end up cooking the flesh. Oh. And it's because, yeah, so all uh, Cornish, and okay, you can stop now, this is not really <laughs> All happened in the conscious is he just ended up roasting small parts of the people he was trying to bring back to life. Uh, and so he thought, okay, I need, I need some way of, uh, you know, heating them up a lot quicker that doesn't involve this. He thought, I could put them into a bathtub, but then the hydrostatic pressure of that water is going to counteract the, the blood rushing back and forth. So, so tip it back into the teeter-totter position because he decided to come up with a different solution, which was... <laughs> a bucket of water. There we go. And he just thought, I'll pour the bucket of water over them. Oh no, I haven't really got. I'm not that bad. I wouldn't really throw water over you. But yes, he threw water over them, and he kept them sitting back as and forwards. But it still didn't work. They didn't come back to life. So you can put out. I'm sure she's a failed experiment. She didn't come back to life. So give her a round of applause anyway. Take this back. Thank you very much. So it didn't work, and Cornish thought, well, that's a bit of a pain. So he decided to move into a different animal, which was, what have I done with my clicker? Where have I put it? My goodness. Ah, da, 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 da. Aha, there we go. Uh, da, da, da. He decided to go with dogs. <laughs> because that couldn't possibly go wrong, could it? <laughs> and uh, he started experimenting with dogs. He heated up his laboratory to, you know, about as warm as it was in here, you know, at body temperature. Um, and I forgot, yeah, there they are, there's some dogs. He called all of his dogs Lazarus. Uh, <laughs> that's absolutely true. He called all of his experimental dogs Lazarus. He got them from the pound and he gassed them to death. And then he tried and bring them back to life. Oh, yeah, I know, oh, look how stiff. You know, I think this is Lazarus 3 here. You know, I'm not even sure if Lazarus 3 is alive. It might, it looks taxidermy. Uh, but that's Robert Cornish. He's trying to bring them back to life. And the first one uh, never woke up. And he said he, he you know, whined and trembled as if ridden by nightmares as it lay comatose. And then there was Lazarus 2. And Lazarus, Lazarus 3 was kind of his breakthrough. That was the first one that actually came back from the dead. It'd been dead for about six minutes or so. And then being suffocated. And um, the next one after that recovered a lot quicker. We could actually, I said this, it came back and it was alive, and, but it was struck blind. I thought it had this vacant expression in its eyes. And it moved with a strange kind of shuffling walk. That sounds a lot like a zombie to me, right? Uh, so uh, he's, he generated a huge amount of press. He wasn't ashamed, you know, of having people in there. And so Time Magazine and all the other newspapers would come in and they breathlessly covered them. They called them Lazarus 2, 3, 4, 5, but it's not clear that he ever actually numbered his different dogs. And I like to think that maybe he was just hoping that the final successful one would supplant the memory of all the failures that came before it. Uh, but he wasn't impressed by his research in dogs and uh, neither was the, 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 the provost at the university who asked him to forget his laboratory because they were bringing the university to disrepute. And so he went home and he continued his experiments at home, much to the displeasure of his neighbours. And so we come to a bit better. He, he finally decided he was ready to start on humans again. And he tried to get a hold of uh, people who'd been suffocated in, in carbon monoxide poisoning cases. And he couldn't, so he couldn't get them quick enough. And, ah! a brilliant idea. I'm just going to go, you know, California had just introduced the gas chamber. And he thought, brilliant, you know, they've gassed them to death, and then I can take the body and I can bring them back to life. So Thomas McMonagall uh, was a uh, convicted, excuse me, convicted murderer uh, who was stationed in San Quentin, stationed, he was imprisoned at San Quentin on death row, and he wrote to Cornish and volunteered his body to be used in scientific research and attempt to bring it back. And so Cornish turned up and he spoke to the, uh, the warden there, and the warden said, no, you can't bring this guy back in there. For one, uh, it takes half an hour to vent all the poisonous fumes out of this uh, gas chamber, and number two, another half hour on top of that for uh, safety measures, and number three, no, I'm not <laughs> We've all read Frankenstein. We know what happens when you try and bring criminals back from the dead. You know, it's a bad idea. And so he said, the only way that you are going to be close enough to McMonagall to, to start this resuscitation in time is if you sit there in the seat next to him in the chamber. And Cornish snapped back, well, maybe I will at that, and stormed out in a huff. And so the experiment was never carried out, and eventually Cornish kind of lost interest in it. 
and uh, he went on to market a uh, toothpaste for repairing dental vitamins. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, he kind of gave up, and so that's, uh, you know, if, if only uh, Duffy, Clinton Duffy, the warden, had let him try, he might have had a, a true to life zombie come back. So you want a real zombie though, You're not, you don't want these stories of people who tried and failed, you want an actual real zombie, so I'm going to give you a real zombie here tonight. Uh, you want the best zombie makers, there are successful zombie makers in the world, but not human, the best zombie makers, they're in the animal kingdom. And so I'm going to tell you about a wonderful, wonderful little bug. <gasps> I could use my laser pointer at the top. <laughs> uh, Toxoplasma gondii. Alright, this is a little, uh, little, 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 almost looks like a little face. <laughs> kind of cute. Uh, and Toxoplasma gondii is a parasite of cats and pretty much anything warm blooded, but it mainly prefers rats. That's what it's aiming for. And, uh,. Yeah, we're going to illustrate the problems with having a parasitic lifestyle like that because it gets into rats, but it can't reproduce in them. So anyway, well, this is a big I need two volunteers, someone who's feeling a bit catty and someone who's feeling a bit ratty. Rosier. Who's feeling? Are you feeling ratty or catty? Uh, I'm Rosier. Yeah, yeah. Go on then, ratty. You're in the ratty, okay, you've got my ratty, come up here. And uh, where's my catty? <laughs> you, you come on in. Oh, you closest, come on up. Oh. Alright, everyone give them a round of applause. <laughs> Alrighty, so you guys have got your costumes, right? Did you, you didn't bring your costumes. Oh, hang on, I've got something, hang on, I've got a backup. In a very expensive costume, so I'm going to have to ask you to treat them with care. There we go. And uh, for you, sir, the full body outfit. There we go. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. There we go. It's like a transformation, right? It's like, where, where have those guys gone? Who are these people in full body costumes? Running so we have a rat, and we have a cat, and we have this cute little critter that I'm going to call Toxoplasma gondii. Boom. There we go. Oh, careful. All right, so, uh, you're a cat, so okay. just, just ooze cat-likeness. Feel, get in touch with your cat essence. You know, get into characters. There's a method acting I need from you right now. Meow. <laughs> And you said I need you to, to just get your inner rap going on. <laughs> Terrifying. Terrifying. Yes, actually, so you are you are in a fix with Toxic Plasma. So what happens uh, when you, the cat, try to get you the rap? Uh, we need to enact this in, in, in real animal modeling. Uh, you're a terrible rat. So... Right, well, what a normal rat would do would try and run away. Yeah, exactly, He'd run away. Becky, you check that out. You took the metaphor too far, but come back up. It's a good effort anyway. Uh, so, yeah, the, the general principle being that if you're a parasite and you live inside a rat and you're trying to get into a cat, you, you know, it's not a good situation to be in. Rats are very neophobic, which means they don't like new things, you know, they're like Tories. Uh, <laughs> they don't go out in daylight, they're like Tories. Uh, you know, and they don't like to smell cat piss, which, you know, is, that's fair, that's like everyone. Uh, and so, something strange happens when they're infected with toxin hasbacondii, because this thing gets into their brains. And it starts to change things when it's in there. And suddenly, uh, the rat feels a little more bold, a little more proud of itself. Yeah, a little, a little braver, I think. It's not so scared of new things anymore. Uh, it thinks I'll try out some new territory. Uh, and you know what? The smell of her, the cat urine, which normally <laughs> would drive it away, and it's very scared of it, will avoid anywhere it's coming. Yeah, there you go. That's the spirit. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, method acting. Instead of being scared of this kind of cat, it starts to become sexually attracted by it. Right? This is true. It works on this pathway, and the rat becomes, you know, it's the same pleasure pathway, and the rat's like, it's feeling good about that smell of cat urine. It's smelling like, you know, uh, Chanel number no. 5 to it. So it strolls on over to find the cat, and boom, there you go, the cat grabs it and eats it. And then the parasite, you know, passes itself on into the cat to continue its life cycle. So give those two a round of applause. Thank you very much. I, do, normally I, let, I know I normally they keep them, but I have to do this again tomorrow, so I know, I know, I'm sorry. Uh, and so yeah, that's the life cycle of toxoplasma gondii. But what's interesting, remember what I told you at the beginning, 
about how this parasite will infect anything warm-blooded, and it really will. Uh, you can find it in dolphins, uh, thanks to uh, people's habit of flushing cat litter down the toilet, uh, it gets into the sewer systems, it gets up in the ocean. Uh, yeah, pretty much all animals, all warm-blooded animals, mammals, uh, have toxoplasma gondii uh, in them. So, there you go. Here's a man who did some research on Toxoplasma <laughs> gondii. This is a Professor Charles Flegger, and it really is him, and he is every bit as awesome as his picture suggests. <laughs> yeah, I went to see him in Prague, he's a wonderful guy. Did uh, he have and... the DeLorean? Hmm? Did he have the DeLorean? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't ask, but maybe I should have. Um, so, Charles yeah, Flegger, he's at the institute, he doesn't have much money, and one of the things, he's a parasitologist, and every year, he takes his grad students and he does experiments on them, which is what you do when you're a professor, right? Uh, and so he's been doing these reaction time experiments on his grad students, and, uh, and, and I, this is not a joke. He actually gets them to play Dance Dance Revolution. <laughs> so I went there, and there's a room full of these uh, Czech parasitology students, and they're all sitting there doing Dance Dance Revolution, you know, with a little thing on the screen. And he, he chalks up their high scores, he records it all. And he tests them for their, uh, you know, to see whether or not they've been exposed to Toxoplasma gondii. Now, you can't actually tell if it's in you unless you were to carve out a chunk of your flesh and, and, and peel through the muscle fibers to look for it. But you can tell from the antibodies in your blood whether you've been exposed to it. And Toxoplasma gondii is very good at hiding from your immune system. So if you've been exposed to it, the chances are that it is still in there because it gets into your brain. And your brain is in what's called uh, an immunoprivileged site, which means you don't have uh, immune cells inside your brain because it will just, you know, it will just things up if it was in there. And so the parasite somehow it gets in there, and it can hide in there, and it's in your brain. And people who are in the very last stages of uh, immunodeficiency diseases like AIDS, uh, the parasite wakes up, their immune system starts being able to suppress it, and it actually starts to eat holes in their brain. And this is why people who have AIDS in the very final stage just get dementia because they have huge Swiss cheese holes in their brain uh, from this parasite. So as you probably guessed, it's quite common in humans. Uh, and so it's there, and you're thinking maybe it's not such a big deal because, uh, you know, uh, my immune system's all right, it's keeping it in check. Haha, <laughs> check. Um, <laughs> but Professor, he found something quite interesting. He found that people who were seropositive for this parasite actually had slower reaction times. So, which is one of the things that it does to rats, try and get them caught by cats. So he's like, that's quite interesting. He's like, I wonder what else you might find. And so he went down to the hospital and he started taking blood samples from people who'd been in car crashes, who were not drunk and weren't the victims, they were responsible. So they were the ones in control that they'd crashed their cars. So, smash, there we are. I'm not sure if this really is prop, it's close enough. Um, and, you know, what did he find? He found that people who were in car crashes, who were responsible for them, were about three times as likely to be infected with this parasite than regular people, you know, than the, than the population at large. So, uh, it looked like not only did the parasite slow your reaction times, it actually had the same kind of effects as it does in rats. It makes you more, for men, it makes the uh, men more outgoing. Um, no, yeah, that's right, it does make men more outgoing and uh, makes them more jealous. You know, kind of hypersensitizing that. For women, uh, they become more sociable and friendly. Uh, this parasite is tinkering with your brain. So the question is, uh, if you have this parasite in you, you know, if all of you here now, maybe you're the kind of person who likes roller coasters, maybe you like driving a little fast, who doesn't like driving a little bit fast, it's fun. Um, <laughs> but, you know, maybe that's not you, maybe that is the doing human. <laughs> but it's not exactly, ooh, yeah, this is the bit where everyone's like, oh shit, this is, you know, things got serious all of a sudden. But it's true, your identity, your, your actual personality could be in part led by a parasite. If that was the case, would you want to take antibiotics to get rid of it? Because you can take antibiotics to get rid of uh, this bug, you know. Have they tried that? Sorry, have they tried that? Sorry? Have they tried that? Like, and they tried it. An interesting fact. Uh, they, there was a study done on people who had schizophrenia where they treat. Actually, I should do this the other way around. Uh, they thought that they found that people with schizophrenia were more likely to be infected by this bug, so they gave them antibiotics instead of you know, antipsychotics to see if that would make them better. And it was only a small study, it was in Ethiopia, which kind of tells me it was probably was a bit dodge if you have to go over to Ethiopia to do your medical studies. Um, but an interesting counterpoint was they took rats that were infected with Toxoplasma gondii and they fed them antipsychotics. Uh, and they got better. 
<laughs> so the effects of this parasite were put off by these antipsychotic drugs that we normally use to treat you know, psychosis and mental imbalance. So the implication is that if this gets into humans, it can change your personality in new and exciting ways. Now, the, the real big thing is, how many people in this room do you think have toxoplasma gone yeah, inside them? Any guesses? 40%. 40%? Anyone want to advance on that? Depends where they're from. Depends, depends if they've got cats. Oh, you can't tell where the cat, <laughs> can you? Ah, well, does it? Who but thinks it depends on whether you've got a cat? A couple people? Uh, yeah, that's the only connection we've mentioned so far, isn't it? And pregnant women are told to stay away from cats, and this is one of the reasons that we are, because one of the other things that Dr. Buzzwood can do is cause spontaneous abortions, because it can cross that membrane into immunoprivileged areas, like the brain it can also cross the uterus. And so that is why pregnant women are told to stay away from cats, they can cause abortion. And Dr. Buzzwood is quite a big test for. Um, uh, for farmers, and it gets into uh, flocks of sheep, it can cause, and I, I hate the fact that I know this phrase, it's one of those things that you know, the world was a better place before I knew it, but it's called an abortion storm. Uh, and it's where, you know, <laughs> I know, right? Uh, but it's where up, you know, two thirds of your flock will miscarry all about the same time because this parasite will get into them. They will all spontaneously miscarry. So it's a very economically, it's quite a damaging thing. Uh, 40%, uh, any of thousand, 40, 20, high. Who thinks it's, it's more than half? 90 in France. I'm sorry, how much? 90%. 90%? Who thinks it's more than half? Who thinks it's less than half? Oh, it is about 40%. That was actually oh, right, I yeah. I read it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's about 40%. It depends, you're correct, it depends what country you're from because the main uh, source of this, uh, of this parasite isn't actually cats, but it's meat. As I told you before, it's in cows, it gets into <laughs> sheep, it gets into most livestock, war blooded animals. And if you have a penchant for undercooked meat, then that is one of the most likely places that you will get this parasite. So places that like their, you know, their, their uh, less than well cooked meat, such as France, have much higher rates. Uh, this parasite can get as many as 80% of the uh, the population in some places, but in the UK it's about 40, about 40%. So the last note that I'm going to leave you on, you came here to find out how you can make a zombie, where you're going to get zombies. Look to your left, look to your right. One of those people is a zombie, and if it's none of them, it's you. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Yeah, by the way, P.S., buy my book. Yay! Yay! Woo -hoo -hoo! So, yeah, I don't know why that crap came up the top, but uh, how, to buy, how to Make a Zombie is... Uh, I should be writing it right now. Um, <laughs> that's how they come to do this. Uh, I have to finish. My deadline is 7th of September. It should be in the shops by April or by summer next year, so keep an eye out for it. Do you need me to yell into a microphone or can I just yell at you? <laughs> do you want me to yell into a microphone or do you want me to just yell at you? For purposes of recording, yeah. it might be better yeah. to talk into the right. microphone. Okay, I just hate hearing my own voice. So You'll do we, it's my fine. Own voice as well soon. <laughs> um, we have time for a QA. Yeah, yeah, I signed up pretty well. Didn't yeah, I? you have. Yeah. You're so well signed, motherfucker, you are, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes. We have one right there. Oh. Um, so, is there actually any evidence? for zombies having a fetish for brains. Uh, is there any zom any is there any evidence for zombies having a fetish for brains? This is interesting. I haven't actually tracked down where the brain thing first started. So I'm gonna give you a story in lieu of that, uh, which is when the zombies became undead. Because before Night of the Living Dead, the uh, uh, George A. Romero film, zombies traditionally were the Haitian kind. So they were people who were under the influence, you know, who were uh, automatons, who were like, you know, uh, controlled by some kind of witch doctor. And then along comes Night of the Living Dead, and that was the first real time that they were, it's not technically true, there was a terrible film that I won't mention, Plan 9 from Outer Space. Uh, <laughs> no one wants to hear that story as being the first zombie. So the first true zombies in the sense of Raised from the Dead were from Night of the Living Dead, but Night of the Living Dead was a complete rip-off of Iron Legend, and George A. Romero has actually admitted this. Uh, so and I don't think of the Will Smith movie because that, it was good, but it, it kind of took, a, took privileges, you know, liberties with the book. Uh, the original book, they are vampires, they're essentially vampires, they're ghouls. And so uh, 
George Aaron Merrill said he thought it would be interesting, rather than going to the end of the outbreak, when there's only Charlton Heston as the only man left alive, who's the Omega Man, the last man alive, uh, why not go to the beginning of the outbreak? You know, when things just start happening. And so this is why the word zombie does not appear in the film Night of Living Dead, because they're not actually zombies, they're ghouls. Uh, but somehow, it just, you know, because he had a different name for it, and then the studio changed the name to Night of Living Dead, and so that became entrenched with zombies, and that was the first time zombies went around eating other people. I don't know when they first started eating brains, I should know that. I should look it up for you. Next question. Oh, yes, sir. Are there any other parasites known in humans that uh, control your mind? Are there any other parasites known to get into humans that will control your mind? Yes. There's Toxocaracanus, I think, which has similar effects. Um, and there are uh, too many to mention, really, to, um, in, the, in the animal world. I don't know, you know how many of them will get into humans. But uh, there are four parasite species for every non-parasitic species in the world. Uh, they are not the exception. They are the absolute rule of life on Earth. Um, so, yes, would be the answer. There probably is quite a few. Simon Cowell, one of them? <laughs> <laughs> one at the back. So, have there been any cases where someone's been given antibiotics? Uh, so in cases where someone's been given antibiotics to see if their, you know, I seem to see if their behaviour changes yeah. as a subsequent result, uh, it's hard to say because the um, uh, the effects of toxoplasma on humans are very, very subtle, and so it wouldn't be like you would give someone antibiotics and get an immediate difference in in effect. It's easy to do things like with a car crash and look at things at a population scale and say that oh, you know. You know, they, it was 2.6, so people who were going to crashes were 2.6 more likely to have this parasite in their blood. So that was quite a strong effect. But in terms of giving a, a single person, and you know, you'd have to give loads of people antibiotics, and obviously there's medical you know, issues with just mass medicating a bunch of people just to see if there's an effect. Um, so to, to my knowledge, no one has done that yet. But that's a good question. You, sir. Are the antibiotics given just the normal antibodies to make idea of bad infection? Uh, yeah, I believe they are. I, I, I won't, don't quote me on it, but I don't think there's any particular special kind of antibody that you need. Right. Yes, sir. And 28 days later, it was kind of a rabies type thing. Do you think it would be possible to actually like engineer the rabies virus to do that? Or Is it possible to engineer the rabies virus to do that? <laughs> rabies uh, goes from uh, you know the, the rage virus in things. It, that's a fascinating question. In, uh, who's seen the film Wreck? The Spanish film that the people it was released redone as quarantine in the UK. Uh, same idea. In quarantine, the uh, the zombie kind of virus thing that's going on. It's just rabies. They they have taken no liberties with it whatsoever, except they shrunk the incubation time down to a number of you know minutes or hours rather than the months that it normally takes. And rabies is very interesting because it um, people were absolutely terrified of rabies. You look at old paintings you can find from you know 19th century, um, and they've got you know these rabid dogs running into town and people are like jumping through windows and climbing up trees and uh, hunting because they're terrified because there's no cure for rabies. There is no cure for rabies. Um, and, you know, it, it wasn't for 3,000 years. So people were rightfully terrified of this, this virus. And uh, when you get it on you, they had mass culls of dogs as well. All the stray dogs just kind of killing them every now and then when they got a bit too upset. Anyhow, uh, you, you get bitten and this little thing starts crawling, inching up your nerve fibers trying to get to your brain, which is why it's got such a long incubation period. And when it gets to your brain, there's something very interesting. It stops your throat muscles from working, so you can't swallow anymore, which is part of the hydrophobia kind of angle. You can't drink anything. And... Um, uh, it loads the virions into your saliva. So now you've got all the saliva in your mouth and it's full of virus and it's just kind of dripping out of you because you can't swallow. So your, your teeth are like hypodermic syringes. They're just ready to inject that into someone else. But why would you go around biting anyone, right? And that's what the virus does next. It actually starts to, uh, you know, fuel these really, really uh, rage-filled episodes, and rabies is from the Latin word for rage. It is, you know, the rage virus is rabies. Um, so yeah, absolutely, rabies will get into it. It makes you really, really angry, and fuels this aggressive periods when you lash out, and they had to restrain people to them to their beds. But worryingly, uh, if you do go to India or anywhere else like that where they have rabies, uh, the animals can also be very friendly. <laughs> it's one of the other ways that it happens. So and sometimes they're really angry, but sometimes they'll just come and lick you. Uh, it doesn't even have to break your skin to give you rabies. Mm -hmm. An animal value, you, but uh, yeah. So uh, avoid rabid animals at all costs. And, you know, kick dogs if they come near you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> stay away. But yes, absolutely, rabies is a, is a good example. You, sir. So you said that. Um, usually people in infected with toxoplasma um, to keep it at bay with a strong immune system. Mm -hmm. Is it completely dormant 
or is it sort of nibbling away at the brain? Ah, so the question is, is toxoplasma always dormant in your system or is it slowly sort of eating away at you? Um, as far as I know, it's, it's always dormant. You have what's called the, the acute infection, the chronic infection. Acute infection is kind of like having a flu. Most people don't notice because they just feel a bit rough. Um, you know, headachey, uh, achy in the bones, feverish. Uh, and that passes after a couple of weeks and then it lies dormant. You know, it can lie. You, your immune system might have got rid of it all. Uh, unless you do a biopsy, they can't tell. Please, no one go and freak out and go to their doctor and start demanding antibiotics on the basis of this. Uh, the effects are quite small. I like to dress them up for you know, purposes of reservation. But no, you do not need to worry. Do not go and drown your cats. Uh, they're not responsible. Um, do not worry too much unless you're immunocompromised, in which case this can be quite a serious issue. You, sir. Is there any evidence that the only way to kill a zombie is to shoot it in the head with a shotgun? Is there? <laughs> It's a good question. It's a good question. Uh, is there any evidence that the only way to kill a zombie is to shoot it in the head with a shotgun? I've wondered about this, and I think the... <laughs> it's an important scientific inquiry. Um, again, uh, you know, Night Living Dead, they had to kill them and shoot them in the brain. The zombie's quite an interesting idea because it actually represents everything that we want. You live forever if you're a zombie, right? And this is the tenets of, of, of most major religions, probably all major religions, is this idea that if you believe in the right God and you do the right things and you're going to live forever. Um, but the zombie takes that and inverts it. Because we also like to think that our body, even when we die, we can see it rotting. So, oh yeah, the, the body is rotting, but you know them, they're looking down at us from heaven. You know, grandma's in heaven, she's looking down at us. You know, some non-corporeal element of her has somehow retained all of her personality up to that point, and it sits in the ether and looks down on us, and that you know persists and continues on. And the zombie inverts that because your personality is the bit that dies. Like, a zombie doesn't remember, he doesn't speak, doesn't have any feelings, doesn't, you know. Uh, but the body keeps going. And I love that about zombies. So it's this idea that, you know, you, that you, you will get to live forever, but not you, just your body. And it kind of subverts you, it gets people thinking that maybe their body could keep going without them, and maybe in death, you know, it's not the brain that is the bit that lives on, but it is the body. Which I assume is where this whole idea is like, Killing the brain, the focal point being that your personality, your, your core is in your brain. And so it's, it's hanging on to this idea that if someone's shambling towards you, there must be something in the brain, that essence, that purpose. It's what the, uh, I should have uh, really gone through it, but the, the, the Haitians have this wonderful idea of the body being split into several different parts. So there's a corpse cadaver, which is like the vital intrinsic essence that keeps your body moving. And then there's the... Uh, and there's the toye, which is your destiny, and then there's the little angel, little good angel, the big good angel, and the little good angel is your the main things that stop you from like walking into a fire. It's your main kind of instinct and uh, your propensity to do stuff. And then there's the big angel, which is the uh, your personality and all your memories, and, and so that's quite similar to the soul in in the Christian concept. And so the separation, and that's when you make a zombie, is you separate those angels away from the corpse cadaver, which is this bit that's keeping the uh, the flesh and blood alive. So again, just like us, they have this idea of the separation of mind and body. Separation of mind and body, no feelings and no thoughts. It sounds like the Republican Party. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Any more questions? Uh, you sat down there? Yes. Um, do you think sexually transmitted diseases could affect sexual behavior? Is a sexually transmitted disease an example of a, a zombie virus or a behavior modifying yeah. virus? Yeah, I, I, I thought about this. I did ask a professor of parasitology this, because if anything, that seems like the most obvious route to go, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> It sounds like a kind of fun FTI to have. Um, I didn't find any evidence of them. Uh, you know, genital warts probably the closest thing I could imagine. You used to call them French ticklers back in the day. Uh, it's true. Uh, yeah, they give people cervical cancer. It's not fun. Um, no, I haven't found any any uh, evidence that there are that are there are STIs that make you more in the mood. Uh, in case you're wondering. Uh, someone who hasn't asked a question before. You've asked one. I yelled mm, out earlier. Fibber. Go on then. There were recently some cases in America where people took some drugs and like ate people in the street. Yes, the, the zombie, the Miami face eating cannibals, um, didn't take any drugs. The man was on no drugs whatsoever. It was blamed on bath salts, which is what the Americans call yeah. methadrone. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, 
um, yeah, so the, you know, Meow Meow is just going big to be meth right now. They're all going, you know, it's, it's the new Coke babies, it's the new don't do meth, not just, you know, not even once. Uh, but the guy wasn't on any drugs. What's really, really interesting was the guy who was eating that guy, you know, the homeless dude's face. Um, he was actually, he just stopped doing drugs. So he used to self med he was schizophrenic, he had a history of schizophrenia, and he would self-medicate uh, with cannabis, I think maybe with skunk, and he decided to go straight. And so he was off drugs at a time when he had that psychotic episode, decided to eat some space off. So, mm, you know, in this case, it's just being a human uh, that makes you a total asshole. <laughs> What about the fact he was shot five or six times and there was no effect? And he was just a badass. <laughs> <laughs> it's happened before, surely. Uh, yeah, there are people who get shot five times. I mean, the uh, good 50 Cent, you were shot nine times. He kept going. Uh, 50 Cent is the man. Exactly, isn't he? he is the man. And as far as I know, he has no brain parasites inside him. Uh, any other questions? Take one more question. One more question from someone who hasn't asked one yet. So, I think the important question is who would win in a fight between a zombie and a vampire? <laughs> who would win in a fight with a zombie and a vampire? That's an easy answer. The zombie would win. A vampire is just a zombie with pretensions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.